Okay, so I'm going to talk about the work that I've been doing. This is the kind of primary project I've been working on for the last couple of years. And um, I'm going to give you sort of a presentation that's in two parts. And I'm going to try to time myself. I might have to skip to the second part. But basically, I'm going to talk to you about the sedimentary modeling, the computational part in the second half. In the first half, I'm going to talk to you about the kind of project that led me to that and sort of get um, and got engaged in that. Because it wasn't initially through a, like a technical material impulse that I got involved in this work. Um, so the, the work that I do is very much focused on landscape infrastructure. And these are usually in, in cities, but they're also outside cities, as you'll see. And these are structures that are kind of something that um, we have uh, ambivalent relationship to in a lot of cases. So uh, you know, Jane Jacobs calls them border vacuums. They, they have sort of a, a role in our city that while they're essential and very, fun very existentially important parts of our city, they're also sort of this um, kind of dystopic thing that we, have a, we don't have a very good relationship with, um, that we you know, kind of like to despise. So th this is you know, Terminator. This is, you know, the, the, the waterways in, in Los Angeles are often used in films and for racing and just for like a blank space to take a photograph of something. Um, and there, and you know, we, from the perspective of someone that enjoys the sort of stormwater management that they provide, and, and don't, don't get flood, and, and hasn't ever been flooded in their lifetime, they may seem like a kind of ecological disaster and kind of an urban disaster. So it's hard to sort of see the kind of civic function that they provide, and we start we have a kind of ambivalent attitude towards them that makes us think instantly like we can do better, we can improve upon these things, and create something more out of them, and so. A lot of what I do is sort of thinking like, how do we bring landscape architecture into landscape infrastructure? So, and, and you know, if you look at it, you sort of think like, th this is like a simple project. Like all, all you need to do is rip up the concrete and put some trees in there. It's pretty easy. It seems like they just messed up and then we just need to correct the, the problems of the 1950s technocracy. But obviously it's a, it's a much more complicated relationship that we have with these things. In fact, it, you know, there's many different dimensions that we can look at landscape infrastructure through, including, for instance, just the, how fantastically culturally productive these infrastructures have actually been in Los Angeles because they're sort of this uh, area of civil disobedience, this kind of they're outside the map of normal use. They've actually spawned this kind of incredible culture around them. But it's also, um, you know, it's, it's also, and, and like, this picture is, is basically, a def this is the picturesque. If you read about the picturesque, like this is a definition of the picturesque. You know, this mixture of wild and you know, uh, man-made to, together is a, kind of like the, the essential picturesque. So there are a lot of different dimensions in terms of how they've been important in landscape architecture. I mean, the High Line is, off, is another great example of how these sort of uh, structures have actually completely invigorated our field and allowed us kind of a new kind of creative impulse and a new sort of creative freedom. Um, and in some ways, if you look at Los Angeles, all of the open space in Los Angeles relies upon these kinds of structures to kind of be the basis for our next open space. We don't, we're not able to kind of think as big as these infrastructures do in a sort of dumb way. And then we come back and they become a land bank to like transform a whole city. But still, I think there's sort of a difficulty and more of a difficulty in, kind of in engaging within these, with these structures when they're still active and when they're still sort of part of the kind of basic function of a city. That we don't, the, the discipline of landscape architecture doesn't get into, isn't as involved as we'd like to be. And it's much more difficult to get inside of the process. Um, and so even though we sort of can recognize, we know that there are these critical urban kind of divisions or contributors or detractors. And we, we often don't, aren't, aren't able to get inside the, the boardroom and sort of control them and change them in the sort of transformative way that we want. We can't rip out the concrete at the LA River. So, you know, Halprin was working on the, you know, freeway design in the 60s. And, you know, we don't, we're not doing much in freeway design, landscape architects. We're, we're helping the planning. But when it comes to the morphology, it's not really an imaginative pr practice. Um, maybe later when this uh, elevated line is decommissioned, we'll have an amazing park. But in terms of our engagement with active infrastructures, it's quite limited. Um, so I sort of, you know, I, I think, the, I think the, the, our imagination, though, is that we're, we're going to be able to kind of create this um, integrated art and practice, uh, integrated design practice where we combine art and technic 
that we're able to sort of take these civic infrastructures, which are often so strictly utilitarian that we think they're kind of like alien and uh, distasteful, and somehow make them maybe a little yet less useful, strictly useful, and add some art or some sort of other improvements, habitat, and sort of bring them towards landscape architecture. Uh, and I, I think it's interesting just, you know, a little bit that the kind of contrary signals that we have in landscape architecture where we just want to make our, our practice more like civic, civil, civil engineering. We want to make it extremely useful. We want to quantify everything and become more like civil engineering. And so there's an imagination that somehow we would kind of bring these two together and have these perfectly synthetic designs for the LA River or freeways that they would kind of operate on both levels. But the terrain is really not that flat. In general, I find that you know, civic infrastructures and civil engineering, it, it, there's a lot more kind of weight in terms of the, the value of their performance, their basic performances, that when we kind of get into, into changing those to making the LA River, for instance, more green, it's, a little, it's mo often more just kind of a, a little bit of a shift towards landscape architecture or art. It's not a radical synthesis. Rarely do we sort of find that perfect middle ground that we might imagine that landscape architects are going to design. And also with landscape infrastructure, I mean landscape architecture, we sort of imagine making it more useful, but oftentimes we just make it a little more useful. We're still sort of serving the basic needs of just creating spaces that are you know, aesthetic and that make the lives of an urban dweller more pleasurable and more kind of viable. So the work that I do is I, I work on both sides of this spectrum. I wrote a book called Living Systems that is about kind of how landscape architecture becomes more performative. And, it, and it, in that process, I kind of made this realization that we're not, rare, rarely are we sort of achieving this perfect synthesis. Um, and now I've been working on this other end and sort of getting into civic infrastructure and sort of thinking, how does it become, especially active infrastructure, things that still need to like save our lives, you know, save us from the storms or the flooding or you know, provide transportation, how do those become a little less useful? And I'm just kind of, kind of facetiously useful. I mean, I think useful in the sense of like, um, there's a certain priority of performances that we expect certain things to do. And there's certain parameters that are more um, powerful, powerfully political, politically than others. So to get it. infrastructure, um, how is it designed? Where are the sources of authorship? So I think a precondition to really changing civic infrastructure is understanding how it's made. How did the LA River get its stripes? What sort of created a form like this? You know, was it just a um, thoughtless or what, what was the sort of process? Was it even like drawn? Is it just really a drawing that someone made and that's what made, and, and that sort of created what this is now? And if you look into the history of these, you realize this is a timeline of the Owens Lake dust control project, which I'll talk about later. Um, you realize that these are really kind of uh, complex creations. They're, they're large, they're consequential. Um, they're born out of cultural and environmental uh, events um, and necessity. Um, they're instigated through complex legal mandates. Um, they're shaped by civil and geopolitical, uh, environmental negotiations. Um, they're affected, they affect large social conditions that um, create a whole set of other kind of volatile effects. Some people say it's like two really unruly systems. One, like a civic, a, a civil society, unruly civil society relating to an unruly environmental condition. Those two together creates kind of organized into like a somewhat into these rational things. Um, and that uh, it's, it's this kind of contentious incremental process that creates these things. So it's sort of uh, disheartening in a way when you actually learn about how these are made. You're like, this is just an impossibly complex uh, creation. It's like a, it's like a shell that, accrete, that kind of creates something. It's a slow, a slow complex process. Um, and that's not to say that, you know, that we haven't, like that planning and landscape architecture doesn't have kind of agency and a role in, in this process. Um, I worked on the Los Angeles River Master Plan about 10 years ago. 
And um, you know that that is going to play that is playing a role. It is guiding things, and that it is sort of like a uh, part of the process. But it's really not as um, powerful as you might think. Um, it's just kind of a guiding light within the whole thing, and sort of organizes it a little bit. But obviously, you know, they have to work on the ground at that moment and see what's happening, and kind of work with the conditions and be opportunistic and deal with crises or changes of administration, whatever it is that sort of shifts the ground. Um, so, uh, and I just actually included this a lot of order, but I've, I'm writing a book about the Owens Lake because I realize it's a much more complicated problem how the Owens Lake was design, redesigned, which we'll get into later. But basically, there are books written about how infrastructures are made. Like the LA River, there's two books about it. They're both very good, telling you kind of the story of its so-called design or authorship to understand what happened there, what made that thing. So um, oftentimes when I'm looking at uh, infrastructure, I, I like to take a kind of broader view of what, what, these, what makes these things. And I often kind of look at what I think are sort of the, metaphys the metaphysics of the design. So not just the plans, but what are the kind of machinations that create these things. Um, and sort of are there any like things that we can change? Like what, what, what are some other levers and switches and parameters that we can change to kind of get inside their design process and maybe achieve better outcomes besides just making good master plans? Um, and uh, you know, you, you, you search through the archives and you find like, you know, what, what made the LA River into a trapezoid reinforced concrete channel? And uh, you find these Easter eggs that you hopefully can lead to other ideas about what really shapes these things. So uh, one, one of the exciting Easter eggs about the LA River um, was that I found out that the reason why the slopes, why it's sloped the way it is, is because of a work projects administration calculation in the 1930s that calculated the amount of labor that you use per for the amount of materials. And the calculation was designed to maximize human labor. And so they um, figured out if they sloped the channel, they needed less scaffolding, and they could use hand labor to tie all the reinforced concrete, which also came from this, the first freeway in the west, the Royal Seiko Freeway, which was made of reinforced concrete. So th this whole, this, uh, this actually, so you might be like, well, big deal. Like, you know, they, they made a sloped uh, bank. Well, actually, that introduced this incredible human dimension to the river that has made it accessible for your grease car chase or for your photo shoot. So you can walk into the river and go down to the banks. And that human dimension is critical to the evolution of the, of the river and its revitalization. Um, but I think that there's uh, more we can go. Than, I mean, that, that's sort of like kind of great, but also confounding. You're like, oh, that's, that's bizarre. Like, <laughs> how would someone design something like that? You know, that's, uh, that's this calculation. Um, and so some of the things, that, so, so what I'm doing, I'm gonna do a little bit differently with this presentation is, is I've sort of tried to spell out some of these things that I've discovered, studying infrastructures into some axioms. There's just only three, four, I think. Um, one is that the, you know, the ways, in, the, these large scale infrastructures, they're so, consequential, did something, um, I just heard a buzz. Anyway, uh, they're so co confounding and consequential, um, co they're confounding and, co and consequential. The extreme scale of them means that they're, when we design them, we rely upon our expert reckoning of them. It's hard to know the LA River as a single person. So you measure it, you evaluate it, you try to understand its whole thing, its wholeness in all sorts of ways. And then um, at the same time that you're very reliant on that because all these decisions that are hugely consequential in terms of saving people's lives, um, spending you know, major resources from society, um, need that kind of assurance. At the same time you're doing that, you're also, it's also very difficult to actually well account for that river and all the diff different things that it is. Or the Owens Lake, which is this dust control project. So this makes uh, these, these projects excuse them in a way because they're, they're reliant on this kind of fuzzy, difficult data set about how do we understand these things. Um, and if you look at like kind of the lineage of like early civil engineering, 
Um, that was a critical step, though, was measuring these kinds of landscapes and understanding them through metric uh, reckonings. So the, the Los Angeles River and the Panama Canal are both early 20th century examples of basically engineers that were able to measure uh, and survey these things and uh, these, these projects and kind of create these numerical representations of reality and then use that to create all sorts of efficiencies of economy. So when Gotels took over the Panama Canal, the French were sort of laissez-faire making it and suddenly he, did, he made it into this highly metricized project where everything was calculated and economized. In the Los Angeles aqueduct, Mulholland, who built that, was just obsessed. He was like a savant, a savant of metricism. He would know all the different costs for all the different lengths and was able to sort of figure out new tricks about tackling the, the giant scale of, of the problem. And so the, these projects are very much reliant on this kind of technical vision that we have of them. Like, how do we sort of measure and know them? Um, and that kind of, but this is an example of a, Landsat satellite images of the Owens Lake, um, and th these are used to, you know, monitor monitor the lake and understand whether it's, you know, actually controlling the dust. We rely on these kinds of um, all these different ways of illuminating these large scale landscapes, and they are they're sort of uh, they're very powerful, and they allow us to kind of create objective knowledge. And there's also some ways we could talk about objectivity is super powerful. Um, but they're also kind of a strange, it's a strange kind of illumination by which to create landscapes. Because these lights, I sort of think of it as kind of expert illumination. Like, how do you illuminate the world? How do you know the world? I think of these as kind of specialized forms of light. It's like if you were to draw a portrait of someone with, their, with a flashlight underneath their chin, you know, it creates kind of extreme angles. Some things are gonna be hidden. Some things are gonna be more, uh, gonna sort of show itself more. And, it, and, it, and when you make something based on, on these kinds of illuminations, it's going to be a little bit strange. There's going to be a mark of that in the whole process, kind of like a chisel makes a certain mark on stone. Having the kind of ways in which you know a landscape makes a mark on the making of the landscape. And, and that also kind of uh, moves into like how you model it and all the other tools by which you represent a landscape. So in these first early examples, you see a really clear correlation between the technical vision and the modeling and the actual thing that was made. It, made. So that's, I think, a, a major axiom is that connection. And you know, one of the things I'm interested in is just is, is that moment of reckoning is, I think, a big part of what um, makes these landscapes what they are. And then the other, part, the other axiom is from James C. Scott, which is that in inevitably there's a bunch of stuff outside the brackets of your technical vision. There's a bunch of things you're not paying attention to. And that has a huge impact. And he says it comes to haunt you. And, and the LA River is a great example. The LA River you know, is a great flood control structure. It's never failed, really. Just a little bit of flooding here and there. But the city of Los Angeles now wants to change everything. And the Army Corps is like, what? You know, like we did, we work, it works. You know, what, what more do you want us to do? And they're like, well, actually, you didn't pay attention to all these other things, and now we're going to make you redo it. Um, and, and so, you know, that's why you have the master plan. It's like, you, you know, you have to have a more prismatic idea of this thing. You need to think about it from more perspectives. You can't just think about it from this, you know, make an intervention based on one kind of idea. Um, and it's very much in that prism of, like, you know, what are the prisms, the technical ways in which you know these things? And I think it's, it's you know, it's, I'm sympathetic. It's difficult. Um, the last sort of axiom is the kaleidoscope effect, uh, which is that we, our ability to kind of capture a kind of acknowledge a, a large amount of prisms that does not match our ability to synthesize them. So we can, we can, we can have many different perspectives, and, we, and we're getting more and more perspectives and more tools to measure things. We can, we can get all sorts of weird data sets now. We can you know, measure all sorts of things, but how do we put those all together and kind of create a, synth a synthesis is not something that um, we've, I think we've spent less time doing. It's a more difficult practice and actually something that landscape architects are probably pretty good at doing. Um, so that's something that uh, you know, I think is particularly relevant in landscape where um, this is a kind of prismatic concept of like this is the Owens Lake from showing an aerial shot and a ground level shot spliced together, you can have a trippy moment if you 
defocus. Um, and, that, and this is one of the fundamental things that is difficult, is how do you incorporate a subjective view, a, su a personal perspective of a landscape with its kind of authoritative, planometric, objective view? So you have maybe an engineer doing anal like analytical kind of analysis, uh, analytical design of a, of, a, of a landscape, and then you have some, some guy or, or, or woman wandering around who's a casual viewer and is sort of looking at things and having an experience. And those are so far away from each other that you think, oh, forget, forget about that person down there. <laughs> you know, what do they matter? But it, they do matter, and they, they, just, they just do. You know, whatever you, as much as you try, that's, that's the thing outside the brackets that will come to haunt you. You know, and that's what happened at the LA River. They were just like, does it what does it matter? It looks so utilitarian. Um, it works. So how those two come together is a critical um, challenge in that kaleidoscope synthetic moment. And that's something that I've been you know, working on in representations. It's like, how do you represent them together? How do you sort of put those together? Um, and sort of think about that structure of experience uh, from the top and the ground. And oftentimes what happens is that I think it's sort of like this Ouija board. Everyone puts their hands on the thing and they push it around and then that's what you get, you know? And then something blows up and it changes it a little bit. And like, it's not a very thoughtful process. Um, it's kind of Latour and other people talk about it. Like the, you're, this, you're in this forum, there's all these different things in which you engage in and that creates the world uh, through this kind of invisible matter in between that negotiates. But I do think that maybe there's a better, there's some ways in which we can improve that synth synthetic part of it. And the last is more of a hypothesis. Um, and that's the uh, imagination paradox, which I'm gonna, it's probably gonna change that name. But um, the, the, the more constrained and technical design becomes, the more we need a highly imaginative and technical design practice. So that's this kind of weird thing where if you have a really constrained project and it's, there's not much you can do or change, um, you have to actually be more imaginative with its outcome. When you're in, a con you're in like a condition where everyone's like, oh, this is gonna blow up or it's gonna destroy the city. And you're like, we need to like be more imaginative because we need to accept that we can't change this totally and find some completely different model for what this design might become. So the LA River can't, you can't take out all the concrete. So maybe, thank you, Vinay. Um, maybe you can do something else besides restore the river. It's easy just to restore a river if that's, if that's allowable, but if you can't actually change it, it has to look like an industrial thing. How do you be imaginative within those constraints? And I think that that's a stifling element in a lot of projects um, is that you know, there's uh, a kind of unlimited imagination just for archetypal landscapes, and we're not able to sort of imagine these middle grounds you know, that is necessary in these infrastructures. So the work that I do is often sort of focused on, and the research I do is looking at the, lately at least, is looking at the prisms that we l understand landscape through. How do we sort of see it? What are different ways in which we perceive landscape, both objectively and subjectively? Um, and then what are the instruments by which we design? And those are very much related. Um, and so that leads us to the other, the second part of the presentation, which is that my design interface for Owens Lake, which is also kind of like a, you know, a theory, an idea about a design interface for infrastructure, landscape infrastructure. Um, and this is where we get to look at the robots. So, um, and so basically, there's, uh, you know, three parts, that, you know, just some, some Key words, you know, th this needs to be a prismatic interface that sort of thinks about all those different ways in which we see a landscape and brings them together, synthetic. Um, and then this idea, like how do you bring imagination into a process that's usually very stultified by engineering constraint? Um, and this is about a lake that was, that's in uh, California. It used to be um, the third largest lake in California. Um, it's uh, located on the Sierra Nevadas. Is it, has anyone been to the Owens Valley here? Yeah, we got one, two, no? Owens Valley, okay, no one's been there. Go there, or one person's been there. Go, go to the Owens Valley sometimes, it's very beautiful. It's not just dry lakes. Um, but th this is the Sierra Nevada, and in those mountains right there, you have Mount Whitney, which is the tallest point in the continental US. And then on the other side, um, you can see here, 
a little bit is Death Valley, which is the lowest point in the continent. Um, and then in between is the Owens Valley, which is this very incredible valley. John McPhee writes about it. And um, I, I, th this is an article, is Where Chinatown Begins. This is kind of where Chinatown, is it, this is the story of Chinatown. Has anyone seen the um, Polanski movie? Has anyone seen Chinatown? Okay, good movie, recommend that. Um, this is about, so this lake, which you can see here in historic photograph, was a 100 square mile lake and the city of Los Angeles went up to this valley, bought all the water rights and put it in a pipe, took all the water that fed this lake, put it in a pipe, brought it to Los Angeles in 1913 and that's what made Los Angeles. Los Angeles before that only had the Los Angeles River, which 100 years prior to that was a very exciting source of water, but by 1913 it was almost dead. Um, so the, this made Los Angeles what, what it is today, and it was sort of this grand bargain. Theodore Roosevelt was like, sure, go ahead, take it for the better use. Um, and it made this 100 square mile lake into this dry playa. And um, there's a lot of things that people know about this water transfer. It's like one of the most notorious kind of environmental disasters or exploitations, extractions. Um, but, but few people actually know about the lake that was destroyed in the process. Um, partially because this is, this is an alkaline lake, which is a salt lake. It's a terminal lake. Um, it's a strange kind of lake. It's not, it doesn't have the normal lake-like properties um, that you might expect a lake to have. It's, for one, you can't drink the water. Um, but it's actually an interesting ecology and there's a lot of, it had a lot of value. But it was dried out, no one really thought much of it by in, in 1931. But what did happen was that it just, it released, because it was dried out so fast, it released these catastrophic dust plumes um, that were, you know, so far out of exceedance. I mean, well, at, at first, no one, everyone was just like, it's desert dust. There's dust in the desert. But um, they realized, let's see, is that, you know, I thought that was a video. Um, I guess it's not working. Anyway, that was a, you can see the, the, the catastrophe down below. Um, it released this incredible amount of dust and for a long time, no one really could, could do anything about it because there was no law against dust and there was no uh, way to measure the dust, but eventually they measured the dust and they find, found out the dust was so big, so much dust was coming out of this lake that the EPA had to rewrite their whole database because there wasn't enough digits. It was like, you know, everything was a three digit reading and then this was a five digit reading. Um, only El Paso and another lake nearby can match the amount of dust that came out of this thing. This is actually a picture from 2010. It's not that long ago. Um, and so it was way out of exceedance, but there, because it was built before any environmental law, there wasn't really anything that you could do besides control the dust. So um, the, there was this contentious legal battle about making dust control infrastructure. Eventually, the city of Los Angeles was required to control the dust. And they went through this whole process, um, which I could spend a whole other lecture telling you about. Um, but they created this really uh, strange landscape. And um, again, it was sort of like, how do you conceive of a landscape just from a measurement of dust? Like a dust measurement is a very low baseline by which to make a landscape. It's basically you want to make a landscape that does nothing, that's empty. Um, but they had some other requirements where they had to like make it lake-like in the process. So that became a bizarre sort of requirement. Anyway, so they, they created these things. And when I first got there, I was like, what the hell is this short? Like, I understand that shoreline on the edge, the historic shoreline, but what's the new one? What is that? Where did that come from? Like, what is the, what is the sort of genesis of this design? And, um, and this was, again, one of these sort of journeys into like, you know, it was actually, it's the way in which we saw the dust and measure the dust. So they, they would go out there with binoculars and drive around on the, on the roads and draw the dust by hand like a plain air painter um, and try to capture where the dust plumes were coming out. And as they were drawing, they were essentially kind of drawing the lake to be the new lake. Um, and so they, th these are some of the GIS files of all the hand-drawn sketches. Later, it became more like a land art project they had ATVs with GPSs, and they would go out and they would draw the scars on, of the dust with the ATVs and keep a track. And then 
that would become the actual shape of the dust control cells in some cases. There was a whole number of factors they used, but sometimes it was just that direct transcribing. And this is kind of, this reminds me of like Michael Heitzer making art um, with a motorcycle in the, in a, on a dry lake bed, these uh, drawings. But th there's a long story, you can read the book um, <laughs> next in the fall. Uh, but basically the city of Los Angeles ended up making this like really water intensive, super expensive infrastructure that they were um, suddenly the, the master of it. And, and the surprising thing about it was that it was so full of birds and was kind of scenic that it actually became an interesting landscape. And when they came back, and, and just going back to this, the, the, it uses 95,000 acre feet a year. That's as much as the city of San Francisco uses each year. That's potable water in the West. That's a, that's a lot of water in the West to give to an alkaline lake, at, you know, a new, a new one. Um, so there's a longer story here, but basically the city of Los Angeles wanted to redesign the lake so it used less water. And all the sort of things, all the kind of landscape values, all the birds and the scenery that they had created previously, they had done without thinking about it. They were outside the problem scope that they had created. They were just controlling dust and doing it in a lake-like fashion. And now they had to sort of understand exactly what they had created and figure out how to reduce the water. So this is where um, my sort of project came in which was kind of thinking like, how do we begin to think about this problem? How do we create a way to kind of balance all these different variables? And can, we, can a machine or a material process help us in this design? And so it's actually a much more complicated problem than, than this diagram will show, but it's sort of saying like, you know, there's all these dust control types that you can use um, and they, you, you know, they have parameters of aesthetic value and habitat value and um, dust control value and water use. How do you kind of put this all together and still be kind of create this imaginative process um, that somehow is able to work in those tight constraints and make something better than what was there, um, but maybe use less water at the same time? Because the city, the state which owns the lake was like, you know, to the DWP, the Department of Water Power, the city of Los Angeles, was like you can reduce water as long as you make the lake more valuable in terms of habitat, scenery, and any other value, public value, um, in the process of reducing the water. So it was a difficult problem for them to, to do. They had created the value and now they had, to keep, they had to maintain it. They did not know how they created the value, kind of. <laughs> they sort of did it by accident. So I, I proposed, you know, I was working on this with students and I was like, God, this is such a complicated problem. Like maybe we can create something to augment the process and help us through the design. And, um, and uh, so we proposed, you know, like what, what about this kind of advanced tool, like what if we create this machine, we, we use material modeling, physical modeling, because I thought that would be an interesting kind of engagement, um, and uh, use digital tools, and basically introduce um, perspectival vision kind of the experience on the ground and interface that with the construction and all the other kinds of ways in which we needed to think about this project. And um, you know, one thing that, that, that occurred, you know, getting into this, it occurred to us that what we were doing was kind of creating an interface and that actually the, the introducing the user, that, that needed to be a bigger role than just someone that was assessing what this was. And so we started to think, I started to think about the kind of idea of like what is an interface how do you sort of like think about a design interface? And you know, interfaces are sort of like ubiquitous in our life. We have one on our iPhone. We have all these different ways in which we engage with techno technology. And there's these, um, and, and in design, we often don't think too hard about the interface because uh, you know, a piece of trace paper, we don't think of that as an interface. You know, it's like we're designing and drawing. We're not thinking too much about you know, these advanced tools, um, but like, the, the, in this case, I thought maybe I could design an interface that not only allowed human judgment and perspectival vision to come in the process, but maybe the human is the only way to kind of deal with the kaleidoscope effect of putting all these pieces together and being a synthetic arbiter and maybe becoming more of an imaginative um, kind of a source of imagination in the process. And because a, a, a lot of times, you know, that, that sort of doesn't seem maybe like a radical idea, but in these infrastructure contexts, it sort of is because and when you do, do large-scale infrastructure 
design human judgment, human perspective is sort of seen as a frail source of judgment, that we need just you know, hard numbers and hard facts. But the idea that I had was that we could somehow enhance that human and think about the interface as a sort of design project to, to put that person in a more empowered position. Um, so that sort of you know, led us to thinking about modeling. The, we wanted to create a physical model as this kind of uh, ultimate way in which we presented uh, and immersed a user in a landscape. So that was the kind of critical piece of ergonomics that the, the, the physical model created was just a presentation tool. It also had this kind of, as an interface, it was really, you know, like using sand was interesting because we can just iterate this thing over and over and over again. It's got these kind of gentle consequences. We don't have to like fill up our room with foam CNC models. Um, but we also quickly found that you know, the, the, the sand doesn't, wasn't, wasn't just simply an interesting kind of presentation tool, but it was also um, an interesting material and that it brought an, a form of material computation and sedimentary logic that might actually kind of apply to the final design and some of the, kind of, some of the intelligences that, of that material could actually enhance our designs and be generative. And so in that way, it became more like the hydraulic modeling that my lab was doing, but actually better in a way. We would do, I would do hydraulic modeling where we would model the LA River using real water. And you know, the, the, the water was a great computational device in terms of being analytical to, to kind of find the parameters of design, to sort of set the limits of what was possible. Because um, we, we could you know, create something and that would tell us whether We'd run the water through it and it would instantly tell us whether this is going to flood the, the city or not. Um, but in, in this case, it was very much just a kind of presentation tool. And, and, and in general, these, these models, you know, engineers sort of secretly know that they're great presentation tools, but they make them for analysis. As a landscape architect, I wanted to, it to be very consciously an, an analysis tool and a presentation tool. But what was, what's bad about this kind of model is that it's so hard to iterate so cumbersome, you have to make these, mo these kinds of models, but with the sand, we can iterate very easily and quickly. Uh, so there is a different, so there's, there's kind of subtle but better ways in which the, the uh, kind of opportunities that the sand provided. And, and it also sort of modeled an anthropogenic process and not like an environmental process. It was, it was modeling, the sand modeling was a way to model how we made things, how we constructed things. So we, we experimented in different ways in which we could sort of hybridize this idea of presentation, um, material behavior, and a, you know, a design process into one thing. This is some of the early experiments. Some, some of these experiments were just like, well, we, need, we actually need like dedicated staff <laughs> to, to figure out you know, some of these things. So we, we, we actually left, we started you know, cutting some corners in terms of like, we don't need this touch interface to the whole process. Um, this is the kind of, this is the machine that we created. Um, this is the kind of environment that we worked in with the robotic arm. We actually pitched this to the Department of Water and Power and they were on board. Um, and then th they ended up not taking, um, ended up not working that way. So we ended up getting a, another person to fund our project. Um, so we were sort of tangentially involved with the, uh, with the Department of Water and Power. So this sand model, this bed, based on sort of the ergonomics of like human interaction and the, the robot arm, how far the robot arm can reach, represents a portion of the lake bed. And it's kind of a, it's a prototypical portion, it's not the whole thing, so we're just developing ideas within this prototypical portion, showing kind of the scale relationship. The Owens Lake is really big, and so this is a very small portion of it, but it's kind of as much as you can experience uh, from one spot. The robot arm has a bunch of different end arm tools. And these end arm tools really dictate the kind of material intelligence that we get out of the sand. There's a, there's a number of tools. I'll, sh I'll, show you, I'll show you how they kind of work together. There's both documentation tools, calibration tools, and sand manipulation tools. Um, but the three main sort of sand manipulation tools were, there's a, were, were these. There's a deposition, a subtraction, and um, a raking tool or a manipulation tool. And each of these elicit a different material intelligence out of the sand. And they also each have kind of a different design ergonomic or model. So, um, you know, subtraction is more like a CNC mill. It's like running a router across material. You subtract the material out and that becomes the design. 
Um, and that actually wasn't, that, that, that's why I, we thought we were going to do that first, but that wasn't so interesting because it wasn't generative. We knew we had to just make the 3D model and then we, ma we subtracted it. So what became the most fascinating was working with raking, which, which really, I think, engages with this kind of other sedimentary behavior of, of repose um, that, is, that accumulates. You, know, you have this kind of, the, the kind of movement and the flow of the sand accumulates into these other forms that exceed the original design idea that we had. Um, and there's also other kind of benefits to it, like in terms of landscape architecture, this is an instantly balanced cut fill because we don't add any material, we don't subtract any material. So there's sort of an economy to that. Um, and it started to look, you know, the early experiments were like, oh, well, this looks like, at least we can make it something that looks like what's already out there. Um, and, uh, you know, we started thinking about how we sort of guide the, the, the raking and, you know, the, the kind of obvious thing that we had to do is create tool paths. So we created an, a series of uh, grasshopper scripts that would create different algorithms for tool paths because we were kind of, we wanted to work within a kind of a, a idea that we could reproduce and expand anything that we made across a much larger expanse. So it wasn't so, you know, it wasn't kind of handcrafted um, in the, you know, that we were drawing each piece. But it was also, th these were complicated and difficult. It's not easy to make something that looks decent out of sand. It's a very difficult material when you rake it. Um, and so the whole process is, is, is uses a kind of a choreography of these tools. We have the subtraction process, which um, will subtract out the original site conditions. So that gives, you, that gives us the base conditions, which um, are given. And then we have um, the raking, which follows these individual tool paths um, that creates these you know, features. And, and you know, th these features have different implications in terms of habitat, and, you know, um, water use, uh, experience. Of course, the sand model, you know, like it's, it's, a, it's both a kind of Spartan um, representation, but also a rich one. Uh, it's exciting to look at, but it obviously doesn't show us all these other factors. It only shows us the shape. But it's also, you know, we can light it really nice. We can look at it from below, from above. Um, let's see, let me skip ahead here. Uh, so we made these forms. And then after... So the, the key thing is after we're done um, making the, raking it, we photograph it according to script, and then we laser scan it, which is a critical part of taking it to the next level. And that was just kind of a challenge to get that going. And then actually we, we uh, vacuum form them too to keep another record, a physical record. So this is our vacuum form set up in downtown Los Angeles. Um, I'll show you that later. Uh, so the, these created, you know, there was an interesting sort of gap and space between the tool paths and the actual objects. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, you can't say that this is the same as bulldozers. Bulldozers aren't this delicate. Bulldozers try to achieve like a very specific form. They're not kind of open to the sedimentary repose. But I do think they're sort of, the, by making forms this way, it sort of adheres to a, a kind of sedimentary logic that could be useful and could be a model for, you know, building something in the field. Um, and that maybe is a more economic mo economical model or sort of truer to sediment in a way. So there's a, I think there's a potential, but I'm not going to say that my rake exactly represents a bulldozer and that bulldozer is going to run around according to this algorithm that I've you know, designed here. Um, so this led to uh, building an interface around the sand modeling, because the sand modeling was only doing this, creating the form, which I thought was very important. But we also wanted to sort of look into the other parameters because there's all these other things we need to know, like what was the habitat value? There was a very like, elaborate habitat model that was made for the Owens Lake. Um, what does it look like when you put water in it? How do you design it? What's the kind of experience inside? So we created this system that um, has a perspectival view. It's a software system and then also projects onto the landscape and um, creates a kind of like a interface game that lets you go inside of that space and start to fiddle with it. And, and here de design is not so much this like spontaneous creative process, but more of like a search, a process of searching. Um, you have all these computational tools and responses uh, and different w things that you're able to model. And then you sort of look through it. You're trying to find something that you like or you want and you're fiddling and you're adjusting and calibrating. Um, you're working within this boundary condition that you've, that 
all these different things I've created. The boundary of the materiality, the boundary of light and dark, the boundary of the habitat. Um, and, and, it was really, and it was really satisfying to kind of go through this process from something, you know, a line to a digital kind of rendering. Um, and and th this is sort of, you know, like what I imagine sort of a more prismatic representation of these kinds of designs that you're thinking about perspectival, time of day, experience, habitat value, water use, all at once. And you're sort of looking, you're able to sort of process that all together and think about it as one kind of opportunity. Um, and just, I have just a minute, 30 seconds left, but you know, th this, one, one of the key things about this was that we were interested in this idea of play and imagination that what we kind of created was a game almost. And, and I think, you, you know, we can sort of trivialize a game, but a game is sort of becoming an important part of, of the ways in which we interact with technology. And it doesn't always, you know, a game can be a simulation. It can be uh, how we operate a drone. There is sort of like actually kind of a, a nice quality about games in terms of the playfulness. And there's a whole theory about what, how play works, but basically play is about creating a circle, or they call it magic circle sometimes, that like encloses your, where you can kind of act irrationally or creatively or imaginatively. And I think one of the difficult things with these landscapes is how do you create that circle? Because it's so technically complex. Um, so this tool, we sort of thought, well, we kind of had done that. We kind of created an enclosure for someone to play around with. It's like, um, and not, you know, jump the shark, essentially. So that, that was the impulse. We're like, well, if this is about introducing humanness and introducing kind of human judgment, why not introduce it to a much larger crowd, a, a much larger mix? And so we created a game, I, I created a game in the lab which um, lets users, like any user, kind of engage with the designs and sort of um, uh, engage with the tools. And as a re reward, you, get a, you make a postcard. And this is a kind of a, a more advanced postcard. It gives you statistics on the edge about your habitat and your water use. But it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a rhetorical device, I think. It's sort of like, it's telling people that like, you know, uh, it's, it's arguing for a different future at the same time that it's kind of celebrating something that you did or is kind of a souvenir. It's like a souvenir that leads us to a new future. So this is the game. Um, uh, if I had a bigger luggage compartment, I could have brought it. Um, I don't know how to, oh, there it is. Um, anyways, so you, you slide these vacuum form things in and out and you can, it shows you a video of how this was made um, and then you can explore them, adjust them, and then um, it will uh, print out, you can choose your favorite and it prints out a postcard. Um, and, uh, you know, s postcards still kind of have this talismatic property, I think. They're sort of just these, we sort of have, we, we know how they work in a general way that's useful. Um, so this has been exhibited and it's collected actually a, da a, a data set of postcards so far um, that, that I've, I'm graphing out here according to the amount of water that they use and then the time of day um, as sort of just sort of seen where people were kind of an aesthetic judgment meets an objective judgment. And that's sort of the kind of fundamental process, I think, behind a lot of this is, is f figuring out how those two pieces of these infrastructures can start to talk to each other. Thank you. <laughs>